So welcome everyone to this new format and the first lecture within the FINEROP interdisciplinary sec lecture series. The goal of this lecture series is to educate our peers that are not from our field in order to let them understand what are basic techniques, key building blocks that we build our research upon in order to facilitate the interactions with other fields. So this lecture is made for you if you haven't studied computer science, you're not an engineer or similar, so that you're someone from a different field and you want to at least get a basic understanding how neural networks can be used for image interpretation. Okay, so let's go ahead. My name is Cyril Stachnes. I'm one of the PIs of the Cluster of Excellence Finorop, and I'm working with mobile robots and images. So we often interpret images. So within, in Finerop, for example, we have one of those agricultural robots that drive over the field and monitor the environment. And we want to interpret our camera data, our sensor data, in order to derive useful information. And this can be geometric information or semantic information. So in this lecture here, I'm actually focusing on the semantic information. So we are not looking into estimating the geometry or 3D geometry of the plant, but we want to identify what we actually see in an image. So for example, we have a camera, the camera observes the ground and may see a plant and should say, okay, what I'm actually seeing here is a plant. So this is the image interpretation task that we are looking into here. And I want to explain how we can do this using neural networks, one of the key techniques how to do that um, and you get a basic understanding how neural networks actually work and get a glimpse on how they can be used in order to interpret images and again this is presented in a way that you as a listener of this talk can talk to someone who builds neural networks and at least have a basic understanding of what they are doing. So the most simplest task in image interpretation is actually a classification task. So we have an input, which is an image from a camera, and we want to turn this into a classifier output. And we basically want to assign a name to that image, something that we see, which will explain what we see on that image. So for example, if we provide an image in this example from a sugar beet plant, um, which we have recorded on our fields with one of our agricultural robots, for example, the classification system should say sugar beet if you input this image. Right, so we want to assign a human-generated label to that image. And that's the goal of image classification. Um, within the cluster, we may want to use those images of plants, but we can also have other images, like we provide an image of a cat, and the system should say cat. Or we have a handwritten digit, um, like this one over there, and then the system should say that's a five. We could train a neural network to tackle all of those tasks, but we typically specify build a network which is specific for one of the tasks. So we do either detecting animals or handwritten digits or plants, for example. What we're also often using is an extended version of this image classification task, which is semantic segmentation. So in semantic segmentation, we also provide a camera image into the system, but the output is not just a name, it's actually the same image, but where for every pixel we have a label per pixel saying what is it what we see in that pixel. So for example, green here in this notation means a sugar beet plant and red could mean that's a wheat plant and the kind of bluish um, color here, it could be the soil. So um, we can also use semantic segmentation, something that we are actually very often using in practice in order to provide a kind of fine grain labeling for every image where we assign a label to every pixel. That doesn't really matter for that lecture because um, we are just looking into the classification problem, but in practice, we are often interested in getting a bit more fine grain um, classification. Okay, so the key question is here is how can we turn pixels into human given labels? So given you had an image where you basically have an intensity value or a color value for every pixel saying, oh, there's a certain amount of red in here and a certain amount of green color in that pixel. How can we use this collection of pixels and turn them into a human given label such as plant, cat, handwritten digit, or whatever it is what we actually want to classify. And we're using a technique for that, which is called a neural network. And we're using typically special kinds of neural networks, often convolutional neural networks. But for that lecture here, we stick with neural networks and tr we'll try to explain what neural networks are and what challenges are in there when we want to set them up. Okay, so what is a neural network? Uh, two words in that, neural and network. So what's a neuron and what's a network? So a neuron can be seen as kind of an elementary um, unit or functional unit. And this word stems from the brain where a neuron is one 
small computational unit in our brain that performs a certain function. And a network is um, a connected or are connected elements or multiple entities that are connected with each other. So a neural network is basically a network of those neurons. Again, the neuron you can see is a very basic unit that can compute something. And the network is a connection of those very simple functional units. So neural networks are not more than connected elementary computation units. And when you use this network, this structure of small computational unit, in order to solve a larger task. So we're taking a large number of these small units of these neurons, combine them together into a kind of a network which pass information from one neuron to another neuron, do small computations all the time, and see if we get a useful result out of that. So we are not taking here biological neurons, we are using artificial neurons. And these artificial neurons, um, here shown by this circle just as an illustration, they receive some input, some incoming values, numbers, currents, whatever it is. It does some transformation of this information, so some computations are happening, and it generates an output. And so it's a very simple thing. Some input, some computations, some output. So if you have some mathematical background, you would say, oh, that's actually typically a function can do something like this. And that's correct. We can treat our artificial neuron as a small function. It has an input vector x, then a function that does some computation with this input vector x, and it provides me with an output. Typically called as y, um, or y hat is the output what f of x sings what x could be. You can see it in that way. And typically, this vector x here is a multi-dimensional vector. So it doesn't need necessarily need to be a single number, like an intensity value of a pixel, um, at least of a black-white image, which is a kind of a single number. But it could be three numbers, an RGB value, or it could be even higher dimensional. So these neurons can take larger input vectors, and they provide us with a certain output. Okay, so we can see this neural network then as a network of those small functions, and then the network itself is a function again. So we may have multiple input neurons, it's also called the input layer, here shown on the, on the left-hand side, where we have, we can see this basically as a vector. So we can write a number into those neurons. And then there are connections, this is our network, and some neurons in here, which I don't really know what they're doing, I call them hidden layers or hidden neurons. And then there's an output layer which generates the output. And basically we can write numbers in here. In this case could be also four-dimensional, it could also be two-dimensional, three-dimensional, ten-dimensional, doesn't really matter. It's basically given by the structure of the network and it generates me an output vector. So we can see this neural network as a function which takes an input vector x and generates an output vector y. And basically those neurons and the connections between those neurons basically determine what this function f actually computes. So if you go back to our classification problem, it means x is an image, the image of a plant, of a cat, of a number, and we should do some magic, and this magic function, the neural network function, should turn this into an output, which could be the word cat, or saying, oh, this is label number one, this is label number two, something like that. And Depending on how the network is built up, it will do different things. And there's actually a large number of different networks out there. So this is actually a large illustration of different types of neural networks which are out there, and there are much more than this. I just copy-pasted out a few. So you can see we have different architecture. They are kind of labels with different colors which have different properties. Um, some of them are just kind of basically like a like a, a directed acyclic graph, so that means there are now cycles in there, others contain cycles, though there's a large number of different architectures that those neural networks could take. And the simplest neural network is a multi-layer perceptron, which is often used. And so one of those called field-forward networks, so this is our input layer, this is our output layer, and there's a certain number of hidden layers in between, and the information flows here from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, this is the input, this is the output, and it generates me the results that I actually want to get. Okay, so let's go back to our image classification example and see what that could do. Let's say I take, an, as an input example, the image of the cat, and the sh system should tell me that's a cat. So I need to take this image and kind of squeeze it into this input layer, or some information out of this image needs to go into this input layer of my neural network. 
And then some computations are done, which I have no idea what they are doing at the moment. And then I should actually generate an output. And this output I should somehow turn into that word cat. Right? So again, in this example, the x is the input image. The f of n is my neural network, this function, which maps the y hat into the word cat. So what we have in here, this is my full input image. This is a function which maps images to labels, and this is my output label. And what I now want to do in the next 15 to 20 minutes is explain you how a very simple network that could solve such a task actually looks like. In the example I'm going to present, the images are a little bit simpler than this cat, I have to admit. But it's basically what I want to tell you here are the basic principles that you can understand really in basic parts how that works. Okay. So let's start with an image. What's an image? An image consists of individual pixels, what I said before. So the image is basically a 2D structure of pixels, of intensity values. And if you have a grayscale image like this one over here, which I will use in my example, these are just values, 1D values for every pixel and just says how bright is that value. A value of 0 typically means black and a large number, typically 255, means it's a white pixel, at least if you have an 8-bit encoding. So this is basically, this image consists of a set of pixels and each of these pixels basically stores an intensity value. So if I kind of have kind of an illustration of pixel overlays here, um, the pixel 0, 0 would be dark gray or medium gray, the pixel 0, 1 would be light gray, the pixel 0, 3 or 0, 2 should be, would be dark gray. In this way, every pixel is associated with a color value, with an intensity value. Okay, so these pixel intensities are the image, kind of basically broken down the image into its individual pixels. And um, what we then want to do is we want to take those pixel intensities and feed them into the neural network, right? So what we could do is we could generate a neuron or use a neuron for all of those pixels and store the intensity value in this individual neuron. So we have n plus 1 of such intensity values. If this is x0 to xn, that means we have n plus 1 values. We can just take those values and store them into the input value of my neural network. So I illustrated that before as a vector, x0 to xn. And now every xn, every number here, is simply the intensity value of my pixel. So whatever I store in that pixel, I basically store in my vector over here. So if you want to illustrate that, we basically have ripped the image apart and arranged them into small stripes and attached those stripes as a long vector. So you can see this vector as simply a vector of intensity values. And those intensity values form my input layer, what I feed into my neural network. Okay? So this intensity values is kind of the first um, layer of my network. And now I'm kind of moving forward and feeding this information at the input to the next layer of neurons. And again, those neurons here are small computational units which take the input, so the different gray values over here, and process this information, change the information, and pass it further on. Okay? So, some magic is happening in here. And then let's look to the output. What should the network output? We do again some magic computations over here until we reach the output layer. And this is an output. So how should this output cat should actually look like? So the question is, is it actually a cat or is it maybe a dog or a plant or a number or a sugar beet or whatever? And so what we say is um, we could actually treat that as an indicator value vector, a vector which consists of zeros and ones, where one means it's actually that thing and zero means it's not that thing. So for example, we could output an indicator vector 100000 if the first dimension over here refers to the fact <clears throat> that this is actually a cat, what I'm seeing in my image. So um, basically the output vector y0 will be turned into 1 and y1 to ym will be turned into zeros. Then I get an indicator vector which tells me, okay, this is object number 1 and not object number 2 and not ob object number 3 and so on. So I'm basically encoding this output label, the word cat that I have given as a human, as this is the object number 0 or number 1 over here. And that's kind of an important thing is that the labels are basically human given labels and the network just say, oh, that's actually the first object I know or this is the first entity I know or the second entity I know or the third entity that I know. Okay, typically if we do those tasks, we are never really certain that it's for sure a cat. 
could be also something actually which looks like a cat, but maybe it's not a cat. And so what we often have, we're never really certain about this, so we have an indicator vector which contains percentages. So let's say we are 98% certain that it's actually a cat and maybe one per, in 1% 1 of the cases it may actually be a dog and 0.1% of the cases would be a human, for example. So we, there's some kind of, we're not, not never really certain, so we kind of have this not indicator vector consisting of zeros and ones, but values between zero and one, where value between zero and one means I'm not fully certain, but it's actually high value means I'm, it's more likely, it's more probable that actually what I'm seeing here is a cat. So, and this output layer is basically an indicator vector that tells me the likelihood that it is a certain object. So in this examples, these again are my pixel intensities that I enter and put output here. And this gives me my output vector, my indicator vector. And it basically means the dimension that refers to the object cat. That is the one which should have the largest value in here. So this dimension in Y, which corresponds to cat, should have a high value. So this is kind of the largest value that we are getting in here. And that's what the input and output to my neural network actually is. And the magic basically happens here in between, in these neurons in there and in those connections, which actually perform that computation of mapping an image into this human label, saying that's object type number one. Okay, so these neurons seem to be actually quite interesting things. And it turns out that the neuron itself is actually a fairly simple thing. It's a combination of combining multiple, a lot of simple things in a network of those connections that I can actually build up a more complex structure. As for to understand what's going on, let's just inspect this single neuron. So we're forgetting about all the rest and we're just looking into this single neuron, which here has an error. So basically I wiped out everything else. This neuron has inputs and those inputs are the neurons here from the left hand side and this example from the input layer, but could be also another layer. So it's basically the inputs from the previous layer of my network. So these are my inputs, call them A0 to AN also called activation. That's what the reason why it's typically called A is an activation. And it generates an output or an output activation of that network. So it takes n plus one numbers, combines them in some way and turns this into a single output number. Okay, that's what we are doing here. So this neuron, so the computation that happens here in this process can be described as a function which takes as inputs A0, A1, A2, A3 and so on and so forth until AN and outputs a new A. So that's the output, and these are my inputs over here. Okay, so the question is, how does this function actually look like? And the neurons we are actually generating are a special type of those functions. So these are basically then, in the end, the activations from the previous layers. This is the output activation for the next layer, and we need to describe how this function f actually looks like. Let's dive into the details and let's have a look how a simple single neuron actually looks like. So the first thing which is important here is so-called weights, W0 to Wn. So it's the same number of input activations that I'm actually getting. And those are weights, those weights are actually values and they tell us how important or what's the contribution of this input activation. So how much should I take A0 into account? If I say W0 to 0, that basically means this thing doesn't count at all. If this takes a value of 1, it means, oh, actually that one counts, right? So that's kind of the way how we want to do that. It could also have a negative weight, and that means it counts negatively to the contribution we are doing in here. And so we have actually a number of weights that we have over here. And then the function is actually fairly simple. What I'm doing, I'm computing a weighted sum. So I say, okay, the input value, A0 times W0, so this one value over here, plus A0, A1 times W1, plus A2 times W2, and so on and so forth. So it's just a sum where I multiply the weight with the corresponding input activation. Then I have one constant value which is called a bias. It's a value B that I add over here. And the whole thing I squeeze through another so-called activation function. It's a very simple function. It could, you can envision this as a sigmoid function mapping values to zero, from zero to one, or it could be um, just a function which just says, okay, if something is negative, I'm going to ignore it. I kind of deactivate the neuron, and then it's zero, and otherwise it's just a number that I put in, something which is called the ReLU function. So, but they are kind of different 
sigmoid functions or um, activation functions that we put in here, we don't really need to care about how it actually looks like, but there's some nonlinear function that we're typically using over here. And that's everything what a neuron does. The neuron just computes the weighted sum of the inputs, adds some constant offset b to it, which is specific for every neuron, so all the w's and b's are neuron specific, and squeezes it through a simple activation function. And this generates the output, so a fairly simple structure. The only thing is we have that for all neurons. So all those neurons in this network over here, they all have own weights and all bi own biases and typically the same activation function. Sometimes the activation function may be different, but for the simplest examples, assume we have here a sing single, simple single activation function. So that means these are a lot of functions, a lot of values, a lot of weights, a lot of biases. And that is true, those neural networks are a huge number of those numbers, of those connections, of those, we call them parameters. So W and B are parameters that we have. And depending how we set the parameters, we actually get a different, um, a different output, a different function that we are computing. And you see all those connections over here. These are the connections. And if we set the weight to zero, it basically means we are eliminating a connection. We are taking the connection out of the graph. And if the value is positive, it's, it's something which counts in the positive way to that contribution. If it's a negative function, it means it has a negative weight um, in this computation. But that's basically it. We have those functions. Okay, now let's look into an example of handwritten digit recognition, which was one of the early examples that was used for training those neural networks. Let's say we have this sequence of numbers and we want to say, okay, what's that, what's that, what's that, what's that? So whatever, five, zero, four, one, nine, two. So that's the task that we actually want to do. And what the system does, it basically kind of basically cuts out this, these blocks of, um, of dark pixels and takes this as an input image of a small dimension. Let's say this in this example, 28 by 28 pixel image. So very small, tiny pixel, but the low resolution, you can actually see it here. And we want to use a neural network to take this 28 by 28 pixel and turn it into the label that this is actually a five. This is the classification example. So what the network has, the network basically has 10 outputs, numbers from zero to nine, telling us what every individual digit that we are seeing will actually be mapped into. And this is the example of handwritten digit recognition. And you can do this with a very simple network structure that I've seen, with a simple MLP, and therefore I'm actually using this in this example. If you have more complex tasks, you typically need more complex networks, but for us right now, that is actually sufficient over here. So every pixel of my input image, of my handwritten five, is actually fed into the first dimension into my input layer. Then I have a couple of hidden layers over here. We do some computations and we basically take the information, we pass it on from neuron to neuron, from layer to layer. So first of all, I can compute the values of all those neurons over here because they just take the inputs from the input layer. And I can co then compute the output activation for all those neurons. And then I go to the next layer and say, okay, again, go through all the neurons in the layer and take the inputs of those neurons, what those neurons set as inputs to the new layer. And so I'm computing neuron by neuron, layer by layer, I'm passing through that network until I reach my output layer from which I then can derive that this uh, corresponds to the object number five. For example, that would be the digit number five. And now kind of how does this network actually looks like in reality if I want to solve this task of recognizing handwritten digits. And we look into a very basic, simple MLP, multi-layer perceptron network that can do that. And it really has just two hidden layers. So we have the input layers, and the input layers is now 784 dimensional, because 28 times 28 gives me 784. So every pixel of my 28 by 28 input image is actually fed into one of those input, as, um, input neurons. And then we have two hidden layers. The first one has 128 di dimensions and the second one has 64 dimensions. So we are reducing this 786 dimensional vector to a 128 dimensional vector over here. And then the next step we are reducing the 128 dimensional vector into a um, 64 dimensional vector. And then we have an output layer which just has again 10 dimensions. And these are the indications. Is it a 0, is it a 1, is it a 2, is it a 3 and so on until is it a 9. Because we're looking into single digits. And I'm basically saying this neuron, which has the highest activation over here, that's actually the, what we see in our image. So if we input our five by five, uh, 28 by 28 um, pixel input image, which here represents the five, all the pixel information will be stored in those neurons. We do our computations. First we compute this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. 
Then we go to the next layer, this one, this one, this one, this one, and so on and so forth. And then we get an output vector, an indicator vector, which says, okay, zero, it means it's not a zero, it's not a one, it's not a two, it's not a three, it's not a four, oh, it's a five. He had put output the uh, one. It's not a six, it's not a seven, and so on and so forth. And this is a 10-dimensional output. So our neural network is a mapping from a 784-dimensional vector into a 10-dimensional vector. And that's what the neural network actually does. And a network as simple as that is able to provide a solid performance of recognizing these handwritten digits, something in the 96%, 97% area. We can even push it a bit further if we take more complex networks, but those simple networks actually do a fairly good job in recognizing those handwritten digits. The question is now, how do I turn the network into a structure that actually does that task? How do I ensure that it does the right thing? So what impacts the structure of what the network does, or the, the functionality of the network, is actually the structure of the network. So how are those elements connected, those neurons? And what are the parameters of those neurons? These are the two ingredients which matter. For now, I assume the structure to be given, so I'm not talking about the structure here at all. I'm only talking about how to set those parameters, how to set those weights and these biases for every single individual neuron so that it does the right thing. And that's something that we need to explain now. Okay, so those networks have a large number of parameters, and we can see this if you just take into account how many weights and biases do we actually have. So in the first layer, we have 784 times 128 weights, then 128 biases, and so on and so forth. If you sum up all those values, this gives me nearly 110,000 different parameters. So it's absolutely impossible to set those values by hand. So I need to have an automatic procedure which tells me how I should set those values, those parameters. And that's kind of what we call training a network or to perform learning, the way we determine those parameters. And we do that by providing examples to the system. So what we want to do is we want to provide examples of zeros examples of one, examples of twos, and so on and so forth, and let the network figure out on its own how to set the parameters so that actually this task gets solved, that this thing is classified as a zero, that this thing is classified as an image that contains a one. So what we have in here is actually what we call labeled training data. So a human needs to sit down and tell the system, okay, that's a zero, that's a one, that's a two, and so on and so forth. So we have this tuples of x, i, y, i, y, now without a hat, means it's kind of the, the ground truth data, which we call ground truths. The human provided absolutely correct labels. And X, the XIs are the different examples um, that we have. So it's basically examples of nines, examples of uh, eights, examples of fives, and then the correct label to it. So this is an example, and that's the corresponding label for that example. And so what I want to have is, I want to come up with an approach, and I will just very briefly sketch this approach here, just give you a very brief idea. We don't go into the mathematical details here, because it's not needed in order to understand at least the concept of neural networks. But the key thing in here is, is we want to have an approach where we just provide this data, these examples, and the system figures out on its own how to set the parameters so that those examples are correct, classified as good as possible. That's what we want to have. And that's what we call um, exploiting the training examples. So for a single training example, um, or for our training examples, we basically take those training examples, so these numbers over here, and as an example, we provide them as inputs to the network, let the network do the job, then the network will um, assign a label to that, so what the network thinks at the moment, and maybe that's complete garbage initially, because if you don't know what the parameters are, it will be complete garbage initially, and then we compare that to our ground truth labels, to the human provided correct information. And what we're basically doing then is we say, okay, that's what we get and that's what we should get. That's what we have and that's what we should have. And I can basically compare that. And I'm trying to optimize those parameters over here that those predicted outputs and the ground truth is as similar as possible. So if I have my network, I put in examples, I let the examples do the job, maybe get this output, network output over here, it says, okay, um, 0 0.9, that's the likelihood that this is actually a 5, and the likelihood of uh, 0.2, that is actually a 0. And I compare that to my actual label, to the human provided information over here. Um, and then I compare those two elements over here. I say, how similar are those vectors? And this is something for which I use a so-called loss function. The loss function tells me how bad I'm performing. And the loss of one of those examples is simply the difference between what I'm outputting, 
this one over here, minus my label. So I'm subtracting this vector from this vector and basically square all the values and sum them up as an example. This tells me the more similar those values are, the smaller the loss will be to zero, and the larger the values are, the further I'm away from that. And what I'm then simply doing is I'm, I'm looking for parameters. These are by parameters here, theta, so that the loss gets as small as possible. And the loss is nothing else than the sum over the losses of the individual examples. So I take what is my network saying, what should it be, compute the difference, square those values, and sum up all the values. And then I'm optimizing the parameters. I'm trying new parameters so that this gets minimal, as small as possible. And if I found the smallest possible value, say, okay, perfect, these are my parameters. So I'm trying to find parameters that, given the training data, the loss gets minimized. And that's all we're doing. And then there's a mathematical procedure behind it called gradient descent, which tries to minimize this function. We're not going to the details here. Um, but the mathematical procedure, which can be computationally expensive, you need maybe special hardware to do that, such as graphic cards to do that fast, in order to come up with the optimal parameters or with the as good as possible parameters that you can find so that the loss gets minimized. And that's basically what training a neural network means. And um, again, for doing image tasks, we typically use a special type of neural networks. We often don't use these MLPs. We use so-called convolutional neural networks, which are special kind of networks which have a special structure over here. Um, and the key thing is, the, the main trick of CNNs is basically that it exploits the neighborhood information. That we're not breaking up the image completely as a kind of one vector of pixels. We keep peak pixels, which are nearby in the image, also nearby in this vector. And we try to basically combine only the neighbors and not kind of weights between all possible pixels. It's a very rough approximation. And then we do the computation over here, which is called a kind of a feature computation, and we see it as a feature computation. And then the actual classifier sitting behind it, which then generates me the output. And so this is something that we call often end-to-end -end learning. We have the raw input here, the raw pixels, and turn them into real outputs, into numbers, uh, into numbers of uh, classes, so saying cat, dog, image, whatever it is. And this is this end-to-end -end learning. We're not providing those features, we're learning them. And CNNs are just a special architecture of those networks which does this job. And with this, I'm coming to the end of my lecture over here. So what you should have learned today is you should get an idea what a neuron is, a small computational unit. You should know what a neural network is, basically a network of those simple units. And we have looked into the MLP as the simplest network, just kind of having this input layer, output layer, and feeding this information from the input to the output, layer by layer. Um, those networks have a lot of parameters. Even very simple networks have a huge number of parameters. And determining those parameters from training data is something that we refer to as le learning or training a neural network. And CNNs are simply special networks which are pretty good for image classification tasks or image interpretation tasks and kind of the gold standard, the standard choice today. With this, I'm coming to the end and I hope both able to give you an idea how neural networks work, that you can talk to a colleague from computer science, from engineering disciplines, from geodesy, um, or any other task, uh, discipline, that works with neural networks, and you can at least talk to that person, get an idea and a rough understanding of what the person is actually telling you. If you want to dive a bit deeper, here are three links to um, lectures. They're all about an hour, a bit longer than an hour, and some around three and a half hours if you want to go a bit more into the details, kind of expand your knowledge that you have learned here in 30 minutes into uh, neural networks, looking into the basics, what I've covered here, um, how to train in neural networks or learning, and what CNNs actually are. And with this, I th thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions now in the live Q&A session. Thank you very much.